Okay, like I said, I'm going to show that the bread and the wine, it's, it's spiritual. But I'm going to show you through the scriptures here. And we're going to start off with 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 1 through 4. It says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. Verse 1, it says, I want to remind you about your ancestors when they were in the wilderness and how the Lord guided them by, the, by a cloud that moved in front of them and that's what they followed and how they walked through the sea on dry land. Of course, we know what he's talking about. That's what he's saying in verse 1. In verse 2, he says, These ancestors were baptized uh, as Moses' followers. They knew Moses was following the Lord and they followed Moses, and they were just like John the Baptist. Baptist, he baptized them, and, and the Bible says they were baptized by him. But now we get baptized in the name of Jesus because it's Jesus we get baptized in. But back in the Old Testament, it was in Moses because Moses is the one who led who led uh, the Jews out of uh, Egypt to set them free. And then in verse three, they ate the same spiritual food. And uh, later on, it'll, it'll show what that spiritual food is. In verse 4, and all of them drank the same spiritual water. So we got spiritual meat and we got spiritual water. The meat and the drink was Jesus, which it plainly says up here. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And just, this is just another verse you can use on Jehovah's Witness or whoever tells you. Uh, that Jesus isn't God. This is Old Testament. This was in the in the Moses in the time of Moses, and right here it shows that Jesus, the Christ, was with them. You see that? It's just things like this you need to remember. Like I said before, if someone says to you Jesus is not God, then just show them this verse. Well, look what it says here. He was with the people when they were in the wilderness when Moses led them. Just little notes like that you should take down. And, and so that way when someone comes to you and makes remarks like that way, you, you have the Word of God to stand on and show them. No, that's not true because right here it says, just make things like this you got to kind of remember because there's, you know, there's a lot of religion, not a lot, but there are religions out there. Well, no, there is a lot. There's a lot of religions out there that don't believe Jesus is God. In Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now here's another verse that the Bible shows that we need to live by the word of God. Can't live by bread alone. How many of us are in here trying to live by just bread alone, the food that you eat at your table? You might make it physically, but you ain't going to make it spiritually. You can't live by that kind of bread alone. The Lord says it right here in Matthew 4.4. 4. We need the Word of God. And uh, in John 7, verses 37 through 39, In the last day, that great day of feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. This great feast back here that I was talking about, and it was a great feast, so it was a big I would, it, was, it would be something like Mardi Gras, where it was a lot of people, just a lot of people partying. It was a feast. And Jesus, it said, and Jesus cried out. Now, if you go to Mardi Gras over there on Proctor Street, how loud are you going to have to get so people can hear you? You have to get pretty loud. And he cried out, and he told him, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Jesus was a very strong man. Uh, the Bible shows that there was many, many times he got whipped, he walked, he walked through 70 Roman soldiers and got hit in the face by 70 Roman soldiers. They hit him in the face with their fists. Now most of us, most of us men wouldn't be able to survive that. It, the Bible says how they hit him in the face with a, with, a, with a board. Well, we know the sufferings he went through and he lived through it. We, mm -hmm. That's in the Old Testament. And, uh, so he was, he was very tough. He was probably tougher than any of us in here. 
to be able to, to go through all that. I mean, he didn't go through it spiritually. I mean, this was a physical thing he had to go through. And he was a man just like us. So here we see again in this verse that the, that the water is spiritual. In verse 38, He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Which I talked about that before. That living water is Jesus. Jesus is the Holy Spirit. Like I said before, being filled with the Holy Spirit is when you feel it, and then it, and then it overflows on you, where people can see see the Spirit in you. Because, you, like I said before, you have the Holy Spirit that comes in you when you're born again. When you get saved, you get the Spirit in you. But right here, we're talking about out of His belly. Out is going to come out of you, where people can see the Spirit in you. Okay, and that's the way we need to be, so that people can see. Jesus in us. Chapter 4, uh, John 4, verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, This is the woman he was talking to at the well. If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked him of him, and he would have given you the living water. Again, Jesus is right here talking to that Samaritan woman. He said, if you would have known who I, who I am, if you would know who I am, he said, you'd be asking for that living water. If she would have known who Jesus was. So Jesus is the living water. A lot of times when it talks about water in the Bible, whether it be Old Testament or New, it talked like in the time of uh, Moses, when they were in the wilderness, God told Moses to strike the, walk, the, the rock because they were thirsty. There wasn't any water. So God told Moses, strike the, walk, the rock and water will come out. So Moses struck the rock, and water came out. Also, in the time of Moses, he told them to, uh, pe people were getting killed by snakes, deadly snakes. And, Jesus, and God told him, he says, get, get the head of a snake, put it on a pole, and everybody who looked up on that pole and see that snake, they, they, it, the snakes won't hurt them. And that was a sign. Uh, there's a lot of signs of Jesus in the Old Testament. The, the whole Old Toast Testament speaks about Jesus, points to Jesus. The whole, all of it. Jesus didn't just get started in the New Testament. He spoke about all through the Old Testament. Uh, the whole Old, Old Testament points to Jesus in different ways. All right? Just like I showed you in, uh, in Jonah, how Jonah was a type of Christ. The Old Testament is, is, uh, is Jesus. This whole book is on Jesus. And verse 39, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the, goal, the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because, the, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now right here he's speaking about the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. In John fourteen twenty six, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you so right here he's talking about they hadn't received the Holy Ghost yet because Jesus hasn't left yet Jesus hadn't died on the cross resurrected but he said I will send you a comforter that's what John says and that comforter is another name for Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit in the Old, there was the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament also in Psalms 51 verse 11 it says, Cast me not away from thy presence, talking to the Lord, and take not the Holy Spirit from me. So the Holy Spirit was in the Old Testament. It didn't live in them like we have Jesus living in us today, but it came on them. You understand? Which, we, which I told you all about that before when I talked about the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, it just came on them. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes in us. In uh, Hebrews 10.22, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience of our bodies washed with pure water. Again, like I said, when it talks about water in the Bible, it's talking about the Lord. It's talking about Jesus. He is the living water. I'm going to show where Jesus... There's two kinds of bread. There's the bread that we eat, and then there's the bread, spiritual bread. And then um, I'm going to go to John chapter 6. And I got verse 30 down here, but I'm going to read verse 27 before I get started on 30. On John 6, 27, it says, Labor not for the meat which perish. Now, which meat are we talking about here? The bread. 
He says, don't labor for the meat which perish. Does the Lord ever perish? So what kind of bread are we talking about here? The kind that you eat. Because that bread does perish. So we know it's not talking about the bread of Jesus. The spiritual bread. But for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So I'm just showing you there's two kind of breads here. The bread that you eat, and then there's the spiritual bread. Believe it or not, there's, there's uh, religions out there that, that don't believe in the in a spiritual bread. They, they take bread as being real meat when it speaks about bread. But I wanted to show you that verse before I got started so you can see that the Lord talks about two kind of breads. The bread that perish and the bread that doesn't perish. I'm going to start in verse 30 of chapter 6 of John. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What thou doest thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. Uh, he's saying that the people are saying that Moses gave us the bread from heaven. But Jesus said, Jesus tells them, I say unto you, Moses did not give you that bread from heaven, because I am the true bread from heaven which the Father gives. So he's telling the people, no, that wasn't the true bread. He said, I'm the true bread. And then verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Of course, we're talking about Jesus, right? He's the one who came down from heaven, and he's the one who gives us life. Because John 5.24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believe on him that sent me, hath everlasting life. So we know Jesus is the one who gives life. Then verse 34 then said they unto him, Lord, even more give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. This means spiritually. Because those of us who in here, in here who've been born again, since you've been born again, have, have you gone hungry? I'm not, I'm not saying... Hungry, like you're dying of hunger. You don't have no food to eat. But if you're on a diet, if you go on diets, which half of us in here do, we get hungry. And there's times we've gotten thirsty working on that fuel laid truck. You can get thirsty in the summertime, very thirsty. So he's not talking about this kind of hunger and thirst. Because he said, Jesus said, "I am the bread." He will never, he will never hunger, and he will never thirst. So we see he's talking about spiritually. And then in verse 36, But I say unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. What he's saying here when he was talking to the people, the people, like I said before, people were following Jesus because he was giving. He was feeding them and he was healing them. So he had a great multitude. He had thousands following him. And he says right here, there's, some, there's, there's those who don't believe. And that's the reason. They weren't following for the right reasons, giving them his heart. They were, they were following him because of what they could get. And there's Christians that way today. They want. And these, these uh, religions that, that say, just ask and you shall receive, that's why they follow. That's why they go there because they, they're being taught, all you have to do is ask and you'll receive. But those, like I've shown before, they take those verses out of content. Because one of them is talking about knowledge. He said, ask and you shall receive. But if you read the chapter, he's talking about knowledge. He's not saying just ask whatever you want you can get. That's why I say, watch when you listen to people, preachers or whoever, teachers. Watch what they say. Read the, the whole chapter or, or the whole book if you have to to understand what that verse means. They use that verse in the wrong context because it doesn't mean you can have anything you want. Because the chapter is talking about knowledge. Ask and you shall receive. Then... Uh, Verse 50 is not on your paper. I started at 51. But on verse 50, it says, This is the bread which is coming down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. So we know this is a spiritual bread. Because how do we not die? 
by receiving Jesus, the bread of life. He is the bread. A lot of times when he talks about bread, it's talking about Jesus. There's not a bread that you eat that keeps you from dying. Only Jesus can. And that's why I read verse 50 because it says, and not die. Only Jesus can keep you from dying. And then in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, meaning his life. That's what flesh means there. Which I will give for the, li for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Does the Lord want us to be cannibals? I don't think so. But read verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Again, like in verse 35, this is a spiritual, spiritual talking about food. Not a physical food. Just like the man on the cross. If this was talking about physical food that we had to have the Lord's Supper in order to, to never die, to make it to heaven, then I guess the man on the cross that Jesus told, Today you be with me in paradise. If you had to eat the Lord's Supper to make it to heaven, then he wouldn't have made it. Right? If that's what people think the bread is. You have no life in you. That's what it says. You have no life in you. Again, it's just meaning spiritually. I'm trying to really point out that the bread is a spiritual thing. There is bread that you eat, but mo most of the time it is talking about a bread spiritually that is Lord. So again, when it talks about living water, when it talks about the bread of life, the bread that came from heaven, it's talking about the Lord. Verse 54, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last days. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. All these verses that I'm reading are speaking about a spiritual eating. It's not talking about eating Jesus. It's talking about a spiritual eating. Well, it doesn't say they were. They don't say they were cannibals, but it does uh, talk about. Like the Catholics, when they have the Lord's Supper, communion. They say that turns into the real blood and wine. Now, let me just say this. I don't believe it. I don't see it in the Bible. But, let me say this. God can do anything He wants. Okay? We know that. If He wants that bread and wine to turn into His, his body, He can do it. He can. And he can do anything he wants. Now, like I said, from the scriptures that I read, I don't see where that happens. But I'm just saying God can do anything. If that's what he wants to do, then he can do it. All right? So now, the other religions is spiritual when they receive communion? Mm -hmm. It's a spiritual thing. Now, again, if they thought it was the other way around, then just like there's religions that say accept Jesus and speak in tongues, they're putting an and. They're saying you have to accept Jesus and. Or accept Jesus Christ and be watered baptized. Again, they're putting and. And right here, if they believe the bread is that way, the Lord's Supper is that way, then they're saying accept Jesus and have the Lord's Supper if you want to make it to heaven. And I've always taught you there's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus, period. There's no and. Because when you put an and on it, then it weakens our Lord. It shows you need Jesus and something else. We don't need anything but Jesus. And I've always preached that. Jesus is the only way to heaven. They can put any kind of ends they want. And Jesus and speak in tongues, yeah, yeah, you can speak in tongues. It's a gift from God, and it's true. But it's not that you have to have it to get born again. About water baptism, water baptism is good. You ought to get baptized, but it doesn't save you. Verse 57, As the living Father has sent me... I live by the Father. So who, he that is me, even he shall live by me. What Jesus is saying here, here, I live because of my Father sent me. And in the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. Just like Jesus lives of the Father. Jesus said that he, he doesn't do anything except the Father tells him. That's what Jesus said. 
And he said, now we're the same as, as, as him and the Father. Now we're the same with Jesus. Whatever Jesus tells us, that's what we ought to do. Just like he listened to the Father, we need to listen to him. Verse 58. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Again, referring back to verse 32. Moses gave them not the bread from heaven. It wasn't the bread that you could live forever. All right, what Moses gave them. And Jesus was plainly putting it out there. No, I'm the true bread. And then further down on verse 60, the disciples said, this is hard to understand. And so Jesus said in verse 63, it is the spirit that quickens. That means make alive, give life. It's the spirit that gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. doesn't say that the supper makes you alive. It says the spirit does. So those of us who believe that we have to have the Lord's Supper is Jesus and, and all these other things, Jesus and, it's the spirit that makes us alive. And we know who the spirit is, Jesus. And the, prophet, and the flesh profits nothing. With that saying, it doesn't matter what we do in physically. It doesn't matter. Everything's done in the Spirit. When you get water baptized, you're not just getting water baptized, you're just getting wet. It's a spiritual thing. You're showing that you're drowning your sins, and when you come up out of the water, you're a brand new person. The Bible doesn't say anything, nowhere in the Bible, where it says to sprinkle. Everywhere in the Bible where it talks about baptism, it says they were immersed in the water. Now the Lord's Supper, when we have the Lord's Supper, these are things that we should remember when we're having the Lord's Supper. We should remember His love. The Lord's Supper is supposed to be a, a glorious, joyful thing to do if we do it right. And then we're going to talk about that. Are you talking about communion? Yeah. We should, we should show, remember His love for us, how He showed us His love. We should uh, think of His sacrifice, how He died on the cross for us. He also says, also think of his return when you have the, which I'll give the scriptures of that, but the scriptures say, also think of his return when you're having the Lord's Supper. And also it says in confession, you should have confess your sins before you do the Lord's Supper. Because in 1 John 1, 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to be clean before we take the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to get in more on that. But 1 John 1. 1 John 1, nine. So these are the things we need to think of and do when we're, when we're taking the Lord's Supper. In uh, Matthew's verse, chapter 26, verse 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. It wasn't really his body because Jesus was standing right there with him saying these words. So it wasn't really his body because he was there in the, in the flesh. So he wasn't really giving their bo- his body. It, just, it was just a symbolic thing. It represented his body, what he was talking about. And in verse 27, And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drank it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So what he's saying, what's, what we're doing right here tonight is just a foretaste of, what, of what's going to happen. He's saying, we're going to do this again, but next time we do this, next time I do this with you, it's going to be in heaven with the Father. He's, this is just kind of a little foretaste of what's going to happen. That's what he's saying here. And there's one place that talks about the Lord's Supper. Another verse where it talks about the Lord's Supper is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 30. Verse 24, And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now in Hebrews 10, 5, that is why when Christ came into the world, he said unto him, you did not want, Jesus is talking to God, saying, you didn't want animal sacrifices. He says, but you've given me 
to give my body as a final sacrifice is what he's saying here. When he says, uh, which is broken for you, that's what he was talking about. He was given his body as a, as a final sacrifice for sin. He says, remember the things I've done for you. You were dead and now you're alive. This do in remembrance of me. Remember the things the Lord has done for you. Remember those things. Like I said, this is a joyful time. The Lord's Supper, you should be thinking of all the blessings the Lord has given you. When it says, this do in remembrance of me. When you take the Lord's Supper, like I said, make sure you're clean. That you confess your sins. Because I'm going to talk about, it's not good to take the Lord's Supper if you're not right with God. But we'll get to that in a minute. Verse 25, it says, After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. He said, Every time you do this, remember everything that I've done for you. Every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. It says, How often, how, how many times, you know, the Bible doesn't say how many times to take the Lord's Supper. It doesn't say do it every Sunday. It doesn't say do it once a month. It don't say do it three, once every three months. Because that's about the times the churches do it. I know churches that do it every Sunday. And then there's churches that do it once a month. And then the Baptist church, they do it like once every three months. But there's no time. There's, in the Bible, if you read, there's no time. The Lord doesn't say do it every Sunday. or He doesn't give a time. He just says when you do it, do it in remembrance of them. Verse 26. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. We recognize that he died on the cross for us. That's what it says. To recognize, to remember that he died on the cross for us. And he also recognized till he come to, rem to remember that he is coming back for us. He is coming back for us. We believe the scriptures, right? Everybody in here? Galatians 1.4 He said... Who gave himself for our sins that we might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God our Father. So the Lord gave his life for us. They didn't take it. The, the Romans didn't take his life. He gave his life. They killed him. But he gave it. He gave his life for us. In John ten eighteen, No man taketh it from me. But I lay it down of myself. Jesus laid it down. So don't think that the Romans forced him to die, to be killed on the cross. Jesus, Jesus said, I gave it. I laid my, my life down for you. In John 14, verses 2 and 3. Now remember, this is the scriptures. This right here, I, I should see a smile on everybody's face. In my Father's house are many man, mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Who's he talking to? Us. us. Is that good news or is that good news? He goes to prepare a place for us. The Lord has already got a place for us in heaven. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> I knew somebody better do it. <laughs> and in verse 3, and if, and he says, And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So the Lord's coming for us again. This, when we get down the press or whatever, we ought to think of these verses. Hey, this ain't home. This is not the way it's going to be. One day, my father's coming for me. And there's a mansion. He didn't say house. He said there's a mansion in heaven for us. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthy shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. You know, many come to the table unworthy, to the, to the Lord's sub. Many come unworthy. Some of them, well, many of them come because it's a ritual. It's a tradition that the church does. And everybody in there does it because that's what everybody else is doing. All right? But they're doing it in the flesh. The Lord's Supper is not to be taken in the flesh. It's not a tradition. It's not a ritual. It's, it's a second next to being born again. It's very, very important. The Lord's Supper is very important. It's the closest you can get to the Lord. These people don't do it in their hearts. They treat it very lightly. They're not serious about it at, at all. 
Like I said, they're doing it because everybody else is doing it. And I have to say something about Teresa. She went to church with her husband, her husband's uh, parents' church, and they had the Lord's Supper, and she didn't take it. Everybody looked at her like, but she didn't take it. She knew she wasn't walking with the Lord. She knew she's not living a Christian life. So she didn't take it. Uh, that's pretty bold, pretty brave. Because, I mean, if everybody's doing it and then you're not going to do it, you know they're going to look at you. Just like Sherry. She covers her head when there's prayer. In our church, about how many people are in our church on Sunday morning? About 300? Yes. Somewhere around 300. Sherry's the only one who covers her head. And she knows that. But it does Does she let, because nobody else does it, does she let that stop her? No, she doesn't. Did anybody ask you ever ask you why, Sherry? But I taught on the women covering their head, and she respects that because it's from the Lord. She's obeying God when she does that. Now, there's... There's things you do in, there's things that you should and shouldn't do in church. And, and one of the things is what I talked about. Taking the Lord's Supper when you're not worthy of it. They come with sins of unrepented sins. When they take the Lord's Supper, they haven't even repented about their sins. All right? This is how serious the Lord's Supper is. I'm going to show you how serious it is. And I hope you all are listening. This dishonors God. This dishonors your Lord when you do that. You're treating His words as though they don't mean anything. Do you hear me? You're treating God's words like they don't mean anything. We're talking about the Lord. In verse 28, He says, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Examine yourselves is what it says. Before you take the Lord's Supper, it says, Matthews 14.31, It says, And immediately Jesus stretched forth, his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, O thou of little faith, examine your, yourself. How much faith do you have? Don't answer, just how much faith do you have? Ask yourself that. Am I doing everything the Lord has said for me to do? Am I? That's the question for y'all to answer to yourself. O thou of little faith, are you doing it? Are we doing it? Most of us in here, I've taught a lot, quite a bit. So we know what the Word of God says. We know what He's said to do or not to do. Are we doing it? Or are we those of little faith? When we're walking with Him, we're obedient to His words. That's what you're supposed to examine yourself on. Are you being obedient to the Word of God? Are you being obedient to the Word of God? Examine yourselves. Before you take the Lord's Supper, examine yourselves. That's what it says. Because you know you. We, we don't know you. I can't tell you where your heart is. But you know you, and God knows you. And He just wants to see if you're going to f- confess it to Him. But before you take the Lord's Supper, this is very important that you examine yourself, that you don't take it unworthy, not being worthy of it. Verse 29, the one my sister already read, For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's Supper. Now, this doesn't have anything to do with salvation. The Lord's Supper is taken by Christians. So he's addressing Christians here, because this is the Lord's Supper. So it's not talking about a damnation that you're going to lose your salvation. It says you bring judgment on yourself for not recognizing how beautiful the Lord is. This is what it's saying here. You're bringing judgment on yourself. You know, we as Christians, uh, we're not talking about the judgment of being born again, because we already got that. We've already been sanctified. We're justified with the Lord as soon as we accept Jesus Christ. But, like I said, there's levels in heaven on what you've done and how obedient were you for the Lord when you was here as a Christian. To me, the word damnation means going to hell, doesn't it? No, not here. It doesn't mean it here. It, uh, there's place, yes, it does. there's different definitions of damnation in the Bible. But right here, no, it doesn't talk about going to hell. Because like I said, the Lord's talking to Christians here. These, these verses that I'm giving, like I said before, always know who the Lord is speaking to. Now, if he's, talking to, if he's talking about the Lord's Supper, if He's talking about communion, 
Then he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians. So it don't mean hell here. It just means uh, you're bringing judgment on yourself. Let me keep reading and I'll, see you. I'll, I'll show you what I'm talking about. In verse 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. And that word sleep means dead. He said because of this, because of taking it unworthy, when you take the Lord's Supper unworthy, please listen, please listen. This is the Word of God. All of us in here said we believe the Word of God, right? He says if you take the Lord's Supper, communion, unworthy, this is what you can be doing to yourself. You can cause yourself to be weak and sick and even die. And the reason I can say die is uh, in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, it speaks about a husband and wife. And they were bringing the tithe money in. And they didn't want to give all the tithe money. So they made an agreement. The husband and wife made an agreement. Well, let's tell them that we only made this much so we don't have to give you know, all of it. So they agreed with that. And so they went to, to uh, Paul and they said, well, we made this much. Well, the Lord revealed to Paul that they were lying. But they weren't lying to Paul. They were lying to the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says that they dropped dead right there on the spot for lying to the Holy Spirit. Do y'all hear me? They dropped dead right there on the spot for lying to the Holy Spirit. So when you, when you read the Word of God, there's, yes, our God is a very loving, gracious God, but He's very just also. He's very just. So when it says down here, for this cause, for, not, for taking it unworthy, when He says you can become weak and sick and even die, I would take that very serious if I was you. If you, before you take the Lord's Supper, you better make sure that everything's right between you and God and you and your brother and sister. I'm talking about brother and sister in the Lord. This is very serious. I mean, these are... They don't push these verses enough in the church. The pastor that, that has the Lord's Supper, if he's not pushing this hard, then he's, he's wrong. Because he's got to let people know, hey... Don't take this. Don't take this if you're not right with God. Because if you do, hey, look what can happen. Look what can happen. So next time you take the Lord's Supper, make sure you're right with God. Make sure. Because you don't want verse 30 to happen to you, do you? I don't. This is how serious the Lord's Supper is. Now the Old Testament, only the priests could take communion. Only the priests. But now... Like I said, with the New Testament, we're priests. He's made us priests. In the Old Testament, only the priests took the communion. But now, in Revelations 1.6, He said, And hath made us, talking about the Christians, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and His Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So now the Lord says, Now we're priests. That's why I tell the men, You're the priest of the house because it says, you are. You, he calls you a priest. So now we, as being priests, we can take communion. Not only the priests in the Old Testament, but now all of us, any of us who want to, can take it. It also says in Revelation 5.10, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So I'm just showing you, we're priests now. There's not just one certain man called priests. God says right here, we're priests. So the title is priest. It's just a born again Christian. Do you hear me? It's just a born again Christian. Saint, same thing. There's no special saints out there. In the Bible, anybody who's a born again Christian is a saint. Hebrews ten nineteen. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holies by the blood of Jesus. In the Old Testament, they had the holy of holies, and only the priests could go in there. Only. And they would even tie a rope around his foot. Because if he went in there with sin, he would die. He would die right there on the spot. It was the Holy of Holies. And the priests, if, like I said, if he wasn't right with God, they had a rope on his leg. Because if he died, they couldn't go in there to get him. They tied that rope on him so they, would pull, they could pull him out. But he says, now, now we can enter into the Holies of Holies because of the blood of Jesus. Also in <clears throat> Mark fifteen thirty eight, And the evil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. When Jesus died on the cross, gave up the ghost, 
that veil that was between the Holy of Holies was torn in two. There is no more Holy of Holies for just priests can go in. Now it's, Jesus. now it's us. We don't have a veil stopping us anymore. Now this teaching, I wanted to teach to show you, because like I said, when you're reading, make sure that you know bread or water. It's, this is all the Lord. This is all speaking about Jesus. All right, this is the Lord. The Lord's Supper is a spiritual thing. It's spiritually. And when you go in there and take it, be right. And remember all the things the Lord has blessed you with. He says, remember all the things I've done for you. It's supposed to be a joyful time. It's supposed to be a, like a celebration, the Lord's Supper. That's the way it's supposed to be. So this is the Lord's Supper and this is the way you should do it. And I've showed you how you shouldn't do it. So now that we know, remember when the Lord doesn't hold you accountable until He shows you. So those of us in this room now know. Now I tell people now, don't go study your Bible and don't go to Bible studies because as long as I don't know, then He, he doesn't hold me accountable for it. The Lord knows your heart. He knows you for playing a game with Him. Alright? You can't use that. But now we do know. In here, now we do know. Communion is, is very serious. and, and uh, But there's a lot of people, like I said, there is a lot of people who do it because one, they don't know what they're doing. And number two, they're doing it because everybody else is doing it. And just like the rest, that's why you have religious people, they follow traditions. What well, everybody else is doing, I'm going to do it. But we as Christians, we should do it because the Lord has shown us through the Word of God why we should do it. I don't do anything in that church over there because everybody else is doing it. If I do, what I do in that church is because the Lord has shown me to do it. Don't ever don't follow don't follow the people. Follow the Lord. 